The most important thing in hunting werewolves is understanding to which specific type they belong. Contrary to common belief, they are divided into many species, and based on this, one must choose the appropriate method of dealing with them. Take, for example, the type I detest the most, lycanthropes. This name comes from the lycanthropy virus, and no, it's not a mental illness where a person runs on all fours, constantly howling and thinking they're a wolf. It's a real virus transmitted through a bite. Yes, just one bite and you're doomed, so one must be extremely careful with the infected. There is no cure for it, but if you think about it, humanity hasn't even invented a cure for tetanus, let alone lycanthropy. So why hasn't this virus spread across the earth, you may ask? The thing is, transformations only occur during the full moon, and the virus is transmitted in its transformed state. On other days, they are just regular people. Sometimes you might not even suspect that your husband is a lycanthrop and live with him peacefully. But then you notice that during the full moon, he constantly goes somewhere on a business trip, fishing, and one day when he comes home without any fish, you begin to suspect infidelity. But that's not the case. No, he wasn't spending that time frolicking with a busty beauty in a hotel. All that time, he was in some shed deep in the woods, howling in pain and scaring tourists. So why does he hide? You may ask again. The reason is, that's where we come in. Discovering a lycanthrope, our duty is to destroy it, regardless of whether yesterday you were sitting together in a bar drinking beer. Yes, it's cruel, but otherwise it would mean the end of humanity. In history, there is even one case called the Lunenburg Massacre. It happened somewhere in Europe. It turned out that the whole town was infected, so the government had to send an army there, as the hunters themselves wouldn't cope. It was truly a bloody event, and I would never want to be involved in something like that. In addition to lycanthropes, there are also other types of werewolves. For example, mutants. They usually live in remote forests or mountains, also found in deserts and swamps, in places where humans rarely venture. And as usual, they are not as dangerous. No, of course, if you encounter one, you're unlikely to survive. But these creatures are smart enough to stay away from civilization. They cannot transform into humans. Essentially, they are animals, just of enormous size and taking strange forms. Unlike lycanthropies, whom you can kill by shooting them in the head, with these guys, it's not that simple. Some of them have super fast regeneration, so we've had to find other approaches to deal with them. Their origins are unknown. It's said that they are remnants of surviving monsters from prehistoric times. Another type of werewolves are shapeshifters. As you can tell from the name, these creatures can take on the appearance of any human. When they are in their true form, they look like wolves walking on their hind legs, though their figure slightly resembles that of a human. These guys are a real pain in the neck for our organization. There were even cases when they infiltrated our ranks. When this was discovered, there was a lot of noise. Shapeshifters are also divided into two types, intelligent and unintelligent. It's simple. Some creatures can have intelligence equal to or even better than humans. Those are hard to catch as they hide very skillfully. The second type acts purely on instincts, and it's not difficult to recognize them. Just ask them. Hey, Ethan, how's it going? If you hear a growl in response, then you better grab your gun. There are also werewolves that appear due to ancient curses. I still haven't figured out how this works, but these creatures are truly powerful. In this case, the entire department is alerted, and hundreds of people rush to resolve this issue as soon as possible. And the last type is the so-called dogmen. These creatures greatly resemble humans. Imagine a hairy man, multiply his hairiness by a hundred, plus make it cover his face and add a tail. And there you have a dogman. 
I don't know about others, but for some reason, they evoke the greatest disgust in me. There's little aesthetics in them. Or for some other reason, I don't know. They usually appear on the outskirts of cities or villages. Their aggressiveness depends on how the creature grew up. If it was constantly chased or treated cruelly, don't expect anything good from it. But there are cases when some old blind woman takes such a child, not knowing what she's raising. Then the creature, raised in love and affection, may not be aggressive, but still its intellect is like that of a dog. And the appearance is frightening. Where they come from is unknown. They appear unexpectedly, like mushrooms after rain. In general, when I first started my job, I began to wonder, where did werewolves come from? And why do these creatures take on the form of wolves? Yes, someone might say it's some cultural layer based on the wild nature. But I know the truth of their real existence. I started asking questions, but no one could answer them. Only one old hunter told me that in ancient times there was an alpha ancestor from whom all types originated. But these were just guesses and no concrete evidence has been found yet. Well, that's about it. If I missed someone, forgive me, I'll tell you next time. But who are you? You might ask while reading this blog. Let's assume my name is Mike. Whether it's my real name is a secret. Once, pondering my life, I suddenly had the thought to share events related to my work. Of course, if I started posting immediately, I would be quickly found out and then it would all be over. So they will be published after my death. Yes, if you're reading this, chances are 99% that I'm already dead. If you've grown attached to me, just pray for me. I'll appreciate it though, on the other hand, I won't know about it anymore. In short, from now on, expect posts from old man Mike. Although I understand that most people won't believe my stories, but if you compare the facts and dig around the internet, you'll understand that I'm telling the truth. Okay, let's begin. I've been working in a top secret organization for about five years now, which is called FAPRO, which stands for Federal Agency of Paranormal Research and Oversight. As you can understand from the name, we deal with everything related to the supernatural world. Whether it's a doll attacking its owners, or a reanimated corpse of a grandmother who showed up for a family dinner the day after her funeral. We've encountered everything. Vampires, zombies, ghosts. The agency is kept secret to avoid disturbing the minds of ordinary citizens. Our work is very dangerous, but of course well paid. Survival here depends on the professionalism of the hunter, and there aren't many of those. Therefore, among the employees, there is a high mortality rate. I'm lucky with my partner, who is as tough as nails. He saved me many times. His name is Neil. If I were to describe him, imagine some big-time thug, at the sight of whom you'd immediately cross to the other side of the street. Got the picture? Well, that's Neil. You might get the impression that we hunt exclusively werewolves, since I started my story with them, but that's not the case. It's just that my first experience was related to these creatures. We were driving along an empty highway in the state of Alaska, heading to a small town forgotten by God. It was a small one. Only about 700 people lived there. This was my first assignment after six months of training, and I was noticeably nervous. Neil, who had been training me for the past two months and with whom I had already become friends, was calm. We were sent to investigate suspicious disappearances of people in this place. Reports of disappearances came from there every full moon, which hinted at the actions of a lycanthrop. As we drove, I studied all the information about these creatures on a special secret government website. It was a kind of bestiary that indicated weaknesses, habits, and descriptions of appearance. Neil, driving the car and occasionally glancing at me, was constantly grinning. 
Apparently, he was amused by the initial excitement of a completely inexperienced rookie. But never mind. At least I'll be ready for the encounter, and I continued reading, memorizing some paragraphs by heart. Soon the car stopped. I looked up and realized we had arrived at a roadside diner. Neil said it was the last place to eat and rest. Ahead of us was a long, deserted road. We got out of the car, and thick steam immediately billowed from our mouths. Neil shivered. He didn't like the cold. I raised my head and looked at the beautiful, starry sky. When you live in the city, you forget how magnificent the night can be. In the diner, we spent half an hour eating and resting, and I calmed down a bit. When we stepped out onto the street, Neil put his hand on my shoulder and said that it was an easy task, and I shouldn't worry too much. I understood that he had stopped here to dispel my negative and anxious thoughts a bit, and I was grateful to him for that. Getting into the car, we set off on our way, wondering what awaited us in that backwater. When we arrived at the designated location, it was already beginning to dawn. Before us stood a typical American town, of which there are many scattered throughout Alaska. The residents were not yet awake, only occasionally solitary figures hurried about their business. We decided to look for a coffee shop, and it immediately appeared at the next intersection. Unfortunately, it was still closed. Neil stopped opposite, and we decided to take a little nap. Two hours later, the landlady arrived, dressed in a huge fur coat of some animal. When she opened the door, we hurried after her. She turned around in surprise, examining us, but said nothing, then went to the kitchen. We took tables and waited. Soon we were brought menus. The landlady, having taken off her coat, seemed to have shrunk in size. She was a woman of about 50, slightly slim and quite pleasant looking. She smiled and asked what we wanted to order. We placed our order and she went to the kitchen. When she brought the food, Neil showed himself from another side. He smiled politely and charmingly, which was new to me, as he looked like an ordinary huge thug. Then he turned to the landlady with a rather polite voice, asking if she had heard about the disappearances of people in this town. She was also surprised by such a form of address, but only shook her head saying that there were rumors, but she didn't know who exactly had disappeared. Mostly it was strangers. The locals were all fine. Neil asked her a couple more questions and let her go. When the landlady left, I noticed that she cast a hostile glance at us. Or maybe it was just my imagination. Perhaps they don't like outsiders in this town. Anyway, the questions we asked her didn't give us the answers we needed, but Neil disagreed with me. She gave us a clue. Didn't you notice? He said. No, she said she hadn't heard anything, I replied. None of the locals were harmed. Those were her words, and they speak volumes. Neil said didactically, swallowing another bite of scrambled eggs. Over time? You'll learn to pick out such grains of sense from sentences like a hungry rooster. These words indicate that there are several possible scenarios. Firstly, if there's a werewolf operating in the town, as we speculated because everything happens during the full moon, then someone is controlling it. After all, as far as you know, during transformation, these creatures go into a frenzy and kill or bite indiscriminately. Secondly, it might not be a werewolf, but some other malevolent creature that becomes active during the full moon. And thirdly, the entire town could be infected. At these words, I almost choked on the coffee that spilled a bit down my collar. The thought of the entire population being infected? With what? It was frightening. But Neil hurried to reassure me. That's the least likely scenario, of course, so don't worry prematurely. 
Let's visit the local police station and find out more details. After breakfast, we paid and left. The hostess was no longer as friendly as she was at first, and this change in attitude slightly alarmed me. When we stepped outside, the town was already coming to life. People were driving around in cars, some pedestrians hurried somewhere, crunching their feet in the snow. Neil headed for the car, trying to start it up quickly and turn the heater on to maximum. The police station was located in the center of town. When we arrived there, there was no one around. We entered a small building and walking down the corridor found ourselves in the reception area. Behind the desk sat a chubby man in his forties with a mustache. He looked at us in surprise as if thinking, what are these two people doing here? Neil greeted him and handed over the documents. They stated that we were from the FBI, although that wasn't the case. It was our cover. We were supposedly from Department 23. On the other hand, if a real agent asked us for documents and saw the number of our department, he wouldn't have any questions. This department really existed and was created specifically to cover us, so we could be called FBI agents, although we didn't report to their superiors. The policeman, after reading the documents, shouted somewhere behind him, Hey, Frank, two feds came and want something from you. My partner and I exchanged glances, smiling. Soon, a man with a beard in his fifties came out to us. This was the local sheriff. He greeted us and asked what we wanted. We questioned him about the disappearances of people in this town and other details. It turned out that mostly strangers disappeared, whom several locals had seen. However, it remained unknown with whom exactly these strangers interacted. I picked up a folder with dossiers, which contained photographs of people of different ages, genders, and appearances. They had nothing in common. They came to the town and disappeared without a trace. Where and how it happened, no one knew, no witnesses were found. Usually they stayed at the hotel or just passed by. Since the town was somewhat secluded, a large number of people didn't come here. We investigated each case, but found nothing to hold on to. Then I came across a folder stating that a 10-year-old girl had disappeared. She had a cute face and curly gray hair. She was the only local who disappeared. I showed this dossier to Neil, and he began to study it with interest. Two policemen kept watching us with displeasure, which made me slightly uncomfortable. But my partner behaved like he was at home, casually shuffling papers and spreading them out on the table. When we finished, we thanked the two of them, to which they grumbled something in response. Then Neil asked them to take us to the house where the girl's parents lived. The sheriff himself volunteered to escort us. We went outside, got into the car, and followed him. It was already lunchtime, and the sun was gently warming, making the weather more pleasant. After driving through several streets, we entered a residential area where there were small, cozy houses. Finally, we stopped in front of one of them. The sheriff got out of the car and headed for the fenced yard, the fence of which was slightly lower than human height. Suddenly, a fierce dog jumped out from behind the fence, starting to jump and bark at us as if it saw its sworn enemy. The sheriff rang the doorbell, which was located on the gate, and soon a woman in her mid-thirties, dressed in a warm sweater, came out. Seeing us, she came out, shouting at the dog and leading it into the enclosure. Then she approached us and asked what we wanted. The sheriff explained to her that we would like to know about the disappearance of her daughter. She sighed sadly and opening the gate led us into the house. When we entered, we found ourselves in a clean and cozy atmosphere. Family photos hung on the walls. There were three of them, father, mother, and daughter. They all smiled happily. We went into the kitchen where the hostess offered us tea. We agreed and sat down on a small couch. 
Then we explained that we had come to this town to investigate the disappearances of people, and we were interested in the case of her daughter's disappearance. She, sitting opposite us, began to tell that nothing suspicious had happened before the disappearance. And one day when she went to the store for groceries, she left her daughter alone. And when she returned, she was gone. Her name was Sarah, and her daughter's name was Emily. As she talked about her, she suddenly burst into tears. Then we asked if there was anything suspicious before that. After our question, she looked up at the sheriff standing behind us, then shook her head negatively. After that, Neil got up and took the sheriff aside. He seemed visibly annoyed, but the intimidating look from my partner cooled him down a bit, after which he went outside. Well, now no one will bother us, Neil said with these words as he sat back down and addressed Sarah. Now tell us exactly what happened. Don't be afraid, you're not in danger, I promise. The landlady nervously clasped her hands as if deliberating whether to tell us or not. Then she leaned in and began to whisper quietly. Before the disappearance, my daughter talked about befriending someone. She constantly drew him on paper how they played together and had fun. He was some old man with a long beard. At first, I didn't understand who it was. But then I thought it might just be an imaginary friend. You see, there are few children around here, so she didn't have any friends. And I thought she was compensating for it this way. Plus, her grandfather recently passed away, and maybe she was drawing him. I didn't pay much attention to these things until one day I found my scared daughter, crying. When I asked her what happened, I learned that this friend was actually bad and promised to take her away. Her words alarmed me, but I couldn't understand where this person could have come from if Emily was always at home. My husband and I were already planning to take her to see a doctor, but then she disappeared. The police started the search, but it soon ended, and they threatened me not to tell anyone about her imaginary friend. Finishing her story, she burst into tears again. We tried to comfort her, after which we asked a couple more clarifying questions and then went outside, thanking the landlady. It was a strange story. But is it possible that behind the disappearances of people is a real maniac? A real person who has nothing to do with the supernatural? When I suggested this, Neil shook his head negatively, saying that we have a colleague in our agency who is called the Seer. He senses places where unusual things happen, and he predicted that this case is connected with something mystical. That's why the agency sent us here. Outside, we were met by the displeased sheriff who stood by his pickup truck and looked so unfriendly, especially at Neil. Neil approached him with a threatening gait and stood so close to him that the cop pressed his back against the pickup saying, Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Neil, on the other hand, loomed over the old man, staring him down. Hell, if such a giant approached me like that, I'd be intimidated too. Neil asked him why he decided to hide the fact about the imaginary person. The sheriff muttered something but couldn't give a coherent answer. No matter how much my partner threatened him, he remained silent, as if his mouth were filled with water. Understanding that we wouldn't get anything out of him, Neil let him go and we headed to the car. When we were leaving, the sheriff kept giving us a hostile look until we disappeared around the corner. Neil kept swearing, saying that guy was hiding something. But soon it will get dark and there will be a full moon in the sky, so whatever creature or whoever it was will show itself. We stopped at a diner and decided to split up to individually search for anything suspicious. Neil warned me to be careful and to immediately get in touch if anything happened, then he walked down the street. I scratched my head, thinking about where to go, and decided to head north towards the city center. As I walked, I noticed that people kept turning around and looking at me, and their looks, for some reason, 
were hostile. I couldn't understand why this was happening. It seemed like they were about to attack me any moment. It was quite unnerving, so I decided to turn onto a less crowded street. It was an industrial workshop district. It seemed like these huge buildings and hangars were abandoned. Some of them were fenced off with a huge fence. As I walked along the sidewalk, I noticed a big hole in one section of this fence. I decided to peek inside to see what was there and squatted down. In front of me was a yard, littered with rusty parts of production machines, iron beams, and other junk. But in the middle of all this, there were children's swings, and on them was a six-year-old girl with gray hair. She was smiling brightly and humming something. I realized it was a nursery rhyme, so I listened closely, and here's what she was singing. One, two, the moon's in view. Three, four, it's at your door. Five, six, the city flips. Seven, eight, it's getting late. Nine, ten, it's time, my friend, to run and hide around the bend. Eleven, twelve, don't just stand, or the bearded man will take your hand. Hurry, scurry, do not wait. Through the alley, over the gate, leap and skip. Quick, 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 before the moonlight grows too thick. Safe at last, we laugh and cheer, until the bearded man is near. Next time the moon begins to rise, remember this and be wise. It was eerie, but she was describing what was happening or would happen in this town. And who is that man with a beard? I roughly remembered this little song and decided to approach the girl. But when she saw me getting closer, she jumped off the swing and ran away. I chased after her, shouting, Stop! I'm not dangerous! I'll help you! She didn't listen and continued running towards the building. We ran past racks of metal sheets when suddenly a brick wall appeared in front of us. A dead end. I felt relieved, thinking I would catch her now. But she didn't stop and kept running. I tried to understand what she wanted to do, but suddenly she just walked through the wall as if it dissolved. I ran up to the wall and began to feel it. But it was just solid brick. Could it be a ghost? After looking around and finding nothing, I decided to search this place for any other clues. But after a couple of hours, I realized there was nothing here. So I decided to return to the diner, which had become our meeting place. When I arrived there, I found Neil sitting at a table, greedily devouring waffles with honey. He had quite the sweet tooth. I sat down next to him and ordered some food for myself. I asked him if he found anything, but he shook his head. Then I told him my story. He listened carefully and said that things weren't as straightforward as they seemed in this case. He didn't share the details of his conclusions, asking me to wait until it got dark. Then much would become clear. It was winter outside, so it was getting dark early. After eating, we started waiting, discussing various theories. Suddenly, the bell on the entrance door rang, and we turned around to see a young couple with a baby in their arms. Neil cursed, saying they were probably not locals. He approached them, talked to them about something, and then came back. Yes, these guys were newcomers, which added to our troubles. I looked at them. They sat at a table, playing with the child, unaware that they were in danger. Time passed, and it was gradually getting dark outside. I noticed that the diner's owner was nervous for some reason, biting her nails, pacing back and forth. It was suspicious behavior. Neil didn't pay her any attention, buried in his phone. Then he muttered that the connection was lost. So, I took out my cell phone and saw a cross instead of the signal bars on the display. Apparently, something was brewing. My partner gave me the keys and told me to grab some extra weapons. We already had pistols on our belts, but apparently that wasn't enough. I went out onto the street and took a long suitcase out of the trunk. There was a rifle inside, then I went back inside. As soon as I sat down, 
The lights flickered in the room and then went out. I looked out the window and saw that there was no light in the neighboring buildings either. At that moment, the young couple of parents were talking anxiously, not understanding what was happening. Meanwhile, Neil sat like a true cowboy, still digging into his phone. I heard a scrape behind me and turned my head. At the counter stood the diner's owner. She was looking at the floor and her body was shaking. Damn, I started to feel like I was figuring out what would happen next. It was at that moment that the full moon emerged from behind the clouds. Right after that, a crunch sounded from behind. And when I turned around again, I saw the woman trembling even harder. Strange glints appeared in her eyes. They shone with an unnatural red color, making my heart beat faster. The woman's body began to convulsively shake, and through the silence, the sounds of crunching and cracking emanated from her bending and elongating bones. Her skin on her hands and face became covered in thick, dark fur. Her hands turned into paws with sharp claws and her face elongated, forming a wolf-like muzzle. Muffled groans mixed with roars emanated from her mouth, only increasing my excitement and fear. The transformation ended suddenly. Now before me stood not a human, but a monster from myths and legends. A werewolf. The animal looked at us with eyes sparkling with wild energy. There was a heavy silence in the room, broken only by my rapid breathing and her deep, steady sighs. I glanced at the neighboring table, where the young couple sat. They stared in shock at the scene, not making a sound. Only the child was babbling something childishly, playing with a toy. Everyone sat in their places, unmoving. It seemed as if time had frozen. But suddenly, the creature took a step, and then I noticed a sharp movement to my left. A shot rang out and a hole appeared in the werewolf's head. The creature fell to the side and didn't move anymore. Neil held a pistol in his hand, from the barrel of which a light smoke escaped. The baby started crying, and the mother screamed in fear. I approached them and tried to explain that we were law enforcement officers and that they might be in danger. So they had to do what we said. Surprisingly, they all quickly understood and tried to calm the baby. After that, Neil went to the kitchen and called me after him. We found a staircase to the attic and went upstairs. Standing on the roof, I looked around. A terrible scene unfolded before me. The streets were filled with werewolves. Some of them fought among themselves, emitting menacing roars and sounds of blows. The fur on their backs bristled and their eyes sparkled in the darkness. Other werewolves, moving on all fours, diligently sniffed the ground, looking for traces of prey. Their nostrils flared with each breath, and they periodically stopped, listening to the slightest sounds. Sometimes they raised their heads, directing their gaze at various sounds or movements, and then rushed into the darkness after the detected prey. At the intersection, two large creatures were locked in a fierce battle, their snarls and cries echoing throughout the neighborhood. Sharp fangs gleamed under the moonlight as they attempted to deliver decisive blows. Nearby, smaller werewolves flitted about, hoping for the outcome of the fight, perhaps anticipating scraps from the victor. One of the werewolves suddenly broke away from the ground and, spreading wide its front paws, dashed towards the dumpsters beside one of the buildings. It began methodically rummaging through them, tossing the contents onto the street in search of food. The iron containers rang loudly under its powerful strikes. All of this created an atmosphere of absolute chaos and horror. I felt like a witness to some apocalyptic scene where civilization had receded before primal instinct and wild cruelty. Damn, so the whole city was infected after all? Is this going to be a repeat of the Lundberg tragedy? Neil murmured quietly beside me. We need to find a way to get out of here before they sense us. But before leaving, he pulled out a phone. 
not the one he had been stuck to before. It was a satellite phone. He dialed a number and waited for an answer. Soon, a young female voice sounded on the other end, asking what had happened. Neil briefly explained the situation, after which he was asked to wait. This time I heard a deep male voice that ordered us to leave the city and that we had two hours to do so. After that, the city would be bombed. My partner acknowledged that he understood and hung up. Wait, hold on, I said. Does this mean all the residents of this city will die? Yes, that's right, Mike, Neil replied. Understand that they're all infected, and if this infection spreads beyond the city limits, it's the end of the world. That's why we're here, to address and control such situations. Of course, it's a pity for all these people, but there's no helping them now. It was hard for me to come to terms with this, but I just nodded silently, and we descended downstairs. The couple continued to sit in their places, though they trembled with fear, glancing out the window where hundreds of werewolves roamed the streets. We needed to leave the city urgently. Two hours really weren't much time. I cast one last glance at the werewolf's body lying in the diner and suddenly noticed that the wound in its head seemed to be healing. I pointed it out and Neil sat down next to it, leaning over the body to examine it. Well, what do you think about this? I asked. It's unclear for now. As far as I know, werewolves don't have this kind of regeneration, so it could be something else, Neil replied. But it's too early to judge. Can we cancel the call then? No, not yet. Understood until we're absolutely sure we can't take any risks. Neil began to inspect the premises, then went to the kitchen and soon returned, motioning for us to follow him. We went to the kitchen where there was a fire door. Peering outside, I spotted a small alley. Fortunately, there was no one there. We cautiously stepped out, peering into the darkness and listening for every sound. The street seemed to be shrouded in gloomy calmness, but occasionally a distant roar could be heard. The sounds of fights and the growling of werewolves. Neil walked ahead, scanning every corner, while I and the young couple with the child followed him, trying not to make any unnecessary noise. As we crossed a large alley, the child suddenly burst into loud tears. His crying pierced the silence, attracting the attention of the creatures around. We heard the prowling of werewolves cease for a moment, and then they rushed towards us with loud roars. Neil reacted instantly. He drew his pistol and began shooting at the approaching shadows. I also pulled out my weapon and supported him, trying to shoot those who came too close. Then we ran. Adrenaline surged and my hands shook from tension and cold. The young couple was pale, running with the child pressed against them, trying to calm him down, but the baby continued to cry, each of his screams making us feel even more vulnerable. I turned around. There were more and more creatures. It seemed like our end was near. Then ahead I noticed the familiar figure of the little girl. Looking around, I realized that we had stumbled into the same industrial district. The girl stood near the same fence, laughing and beckoning us to follow her. It could have been a trap, but Neil, without a hint of doubt, dove into the hole and we followed him. Before us was the same courtyard I had seen before, but the girl led us in a different direction. There was a huge brick hangar with massive iron gates. Luckily, they were open. We rushed inside and closed them behind us. There was a screech, and then we slid the lock handle, and then the sounds of bodies hitting the gates could be heard. The werewolves were trying to break through, but they couldn't. I tried to catch my breath. Although we had escaped, we were trapped. Soon the city would be bombed, and then it would be our end. While we racked our brains on what to do next, the figure of the girl appeared before us again, beckoning us somewhere. Neil and I exchanged glances and silently nodding to each other, we followed her. 
Just before that, opening the suitcase and taking out the rifle, I handed it to the guy, telling them to stay here for now and shoot if necessary. It was clear they didn't want to part, but we didn't know what lay ahead. The girl stood by the hatch, signaling for us to descend. Neil pulled the handle of the lid and it opened, revealing thick darkness. I wondered where this girl was leading us, but something told me that if we followed her, we would find answers to many questions. It seemed my partner felt the same way, doing everything silently and without hesitation. We descended into a small room and found ourselves in a gruesome scene. As I took a step, I heard a crunch underfoot. Turning on the flashlight to my horror, I discovered numerous bones scattered across the floor. They were human bones. Skulls lay here and there, remnants of clothing strewn about. Blood splattered on the walls. Was this a cannibal's lair? Carefully avoiding stepping on the human remains, we moved forward. The girl continued to lead us, beckoning us all the while. We entered a low and narrow corridor that twisted and turned until we reached a door. At this point, the girl stopped laughing and looked at us with pleading eyes before vanishing into thin air. It seemed danger awaited us beyond the door. We readied our weapons and quietly entered. We found ourselves in a large hall illuminated by torches. As I entered, I was hit by a choking odor of decay. Looking around, I realized the source of the stench. Human remains hung from chains on the walls. Some bodies were fresher, some almost dried up. In the center of the hall was a small structure consisting of four tall stone pillars to which a glowing sphere was attached, hovering above and below the ground. Behind it stood a massive statue in the shape of a wolf's head. To the left of the altar stood a man next to a huge cauldron above which a fire burned. Steam rose from it as the man stirred something with a large ladle. He wore a red shirt and denim overalls with a winter hat on his head. Suddenly he turned around and I saw his face. Low forehead, close set small and malicious eyes, large nose and long beard. He reminded me of a lumberjack except he lacked an axe. Glancing to my left, I indeed saw a massive axe lying on the table. Before the man could react, a shot rang out. I noticed that Neil didn't hesitate in such moments and didn't give the opponent a chance to react. Perhaps it was experience. A bullet pierced the man's head, and he fell to the side. We moved on, watching to see if he moved. He seemed motionless, so I approached the cauldron and peered inside. There floated human remains boiling in the broth. This time I couldn't hold back and as I turned I felt someone grab my leg. To my horror, I discovered that the man was still alive. I struggled, pulling out my gun and shooting him in the head with Neil joining in. Finally, I broke free, but the man also got up. It seemed the bullets meant nothing to him. He grabbed the axe and charged at us. We managed to dodge at the last moment, causing him to embed the axe into the floor. We continued to shoot, but to no avail. He ran at me again with the axe, swinging and trying to chop me. His eyes burned with fury and saliva and incomprehensible growls escaped his mouth. It felt like I was fighting a beast. I dodged as best I could while continuing to shoot, causing part of his skull to simply fall off, but he, like a zombie, was relentless. Pressing the trigger, I realized that the magazine was empty. Damn. I wouldn't have time to reload. Eventually, the man cornered me and raised the axe, and I thought it was the end for me when another shot rang out. But this time, it came from the glowing sphere. The lumberjack noticed it and shouted furiously. The axe fell from his hands and he staggered towards the altar. It split open like an egg and crumbled into pieces. To my surprise, the same girl emerged from it, now lying unconscious on the floor. Meanwhile, the man began to melt like a candle, emitting sounds of agony until only his clothes and skeleton remained. Neil approached me and helped me up. 
I looked at him questioningly. He sighed tiredly and replied, One of the rules in dealing with such creatures, if bullets don't work, look for the vessel of their immortality. If there's no vessel and it's all innate regeneration, then look for a bigger gun. Fortunately, we found the first option here. Most likely some kind of curse is at work here. All right, let's check on the girl and get out to the surface. And that's exactly what we did. I approached and examined her. Luckily, she was alive. Lifting her up, we surveyed the room and finding nothing else suspicious, headed towards the exit. But before leaving, I cast one last glance at the statue where a terrifying creature more resembling a monster than a wolf stared at me. It seemed to me that we would encounter something similar again. Emerging from the hatch, we saw our couple, who were fine. They held the sleeping baby in their arms, and when they noticed us, they breathed a sigh of relief. The guy approached us and explained that the noise outside had recently stopped. Neil nodded, indicating he understood, and approached the mother with the child, tickling the baby's ear and joking that this scoundrel almost buried us today. The baby grumbled discontentedly. Neil smiled and headed towards the gate. I stood a little behind, holding the girl in my arms. I asked him if he was sure everything would be okay. He nodded, unlocked the bolt, and then we stepped outside. Naked people lay everywhere. Some of them were coming to their senses while others remained unconscious. They awkwardly turned around, trying to understand what was happening. We began to wake them up, as it was freezing outside. After they regained consciousness and ran off, I suddenly remembered an important thing and glanced at my watch. Damn. There were only five minutes left until the bombing. I shouted to Neil about it, and he calmly took out his phone and dialed a number. He clearly wasn't in a hurry, while I stood nearby, nervously shifting from foot to foot. Finally, after a few rings, a female voice answered. Neil said into the receiver, Patricia, please cancel the operation and send the cleaners to the city. She simply replied, Understood, and hung up. I looked at my watch and realized there were two minutes left. Then I heard the sound of jet engines and looked up at the sky. Dozens of fighter jets streaked over the city like arrows, then disappeared beyond the horizon. It seemed like we had narrowly escaped. So it was all a curse, I said to my partner. Seems like it. Fortunately, we were all saved by that little girl who showed us the right path, Neil replied. What about the residents? Why did they hide the fact that they were cursed? I don't even know. Perhaps they were afraid that if others found out they turned into monsters, they would be killed or they had other considerations. We'll find out soon. I think the sheriff is involved somehow. He's connected to that guy in the basement. We'll deal with that too. We just need to wait for the cleaners to arrive and then everything will become clear. I nodded and we headed towards our car. I still held Emily in my arms, peacefully snoozing. We still had to return her to her parents. It was still night outside, though the full moon brightly illuminated our path. At this time, naked figures still roamed the city, but we paid no attention to them. The job was done, and that's what mattered. 